Well, I have had a message brewing in my heart for a little while. Every now and then that happens, and I've held it back, actually, for a season, because we were traveling through the Gospels and the writings of Peter, following um, his life and, and his development, as Margaret Rose said, becoming a rock, um, engaging and entering into that prophetic identity that Christ um, passed on to him. And then we went through Easter, and I shared with you a little bit about the end times, and last Sunday, the book of life. But today seems like the right occasion for me to share a message that has been brewing uh, within my spirit for a little while. And, uh, and one of the benefits of studying the Bible over a span of many years is that you begin to see things that are woven through Scripture that you, you wouldn't see at first glance or at first read. Case in point... I've noticed that a number of the biblical authors include in their writings at least one preeminent statement, one very important, significant statement that sums up in its entirety what they felt was important to their spiritual life, the most important thing. For example, Jeremiah. Jeremiah reads in chapter 20, verse 9, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. And then he goes on to say, But his word was in my heart like a fire. A fire shot up in my bones. I was weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? Jeremiah is an ancient prophet who was called by God to share God's word to the people. And it was a word of judgment. It was a word of consequence because they were disobedient, they were obstinate, they were a rebellious people. And so Jeremiah was called by God to share God's word to these people. And it was a hard word. And for this hard word, he was met with opposition. And Jeremiah was often ridiculed by those that he spoke to. So at times you can understand that he felt like it would be better if he just didn't speak at all. Why speak if you're going to be met with resistance? Why prophesy if you're going to be ridiculed? So many times over, he felt that he would just want to be, rather keep it to himself. But when that sentiment began to distill in his heart, Jeremiah nevertheless felt compelled to share God's word anyhow. So much so that he would say, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shot up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I'm not able to do that. Now most of us can relate to the song, another Johnny Cash song, now you're learning something about me, called Ring of Fire. How many of you know that song? Yeah, a lot more of you. Love is a burning thing, and it makes a fiery ring. Bound by wild desire, I fell into a ring of fire. I fell into a burning ring of fire, and I went down, 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 and the flames went higher, and it burns, 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 this ring of fire, this ring of fire. Now, you know that this is talking about relational passion, Joseph. There'll be none of that in church oh. on Sunday. <laughs> oh, it's her, yes. Most of us know from experience and when we were first infatuated or attracted to someone that there's a passionate love, a fire that can smolder within us. And it burns and it burns and it burns and it, and it consumes us. But what about spiritual passion? What about spiritual passion? What spiritual passion is like a fire in your bones? What all-consuming value has taken hold of your soul and has squeezed you to act passionately? What burns within you? No matter what the cost, no matter what the consequences, no matter what the level of difficulty or resistance you might face, what passion has God put in your spirit that compels you to act? For Jeremiah was proclaiming God's hard word. His word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shot up in my bones. Even though I would rather at times not say a word, I cannot. It burns. It burns. It burns. What fire burns in your spirit? King David was a man of spiritual passion too. He summed up his passion in this preeminent statement. And you know it's a preeminent statement because it begins with these words, one thing. When someone prefaces a statement with this one thing, 
It's obviously a priority in their life. It's over and above anything and everything else. This one thing, he says, I ask of the Lord, that which I will seek after. That I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Gaze on the fair beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. So if you could ask God for one thing, just one thing, what would it be? If you had to scale back all your requests to just one thing, you would be marking the thing that you are most passionate about. Maybe it would be the salvation of your family. Maybe it's a hope that you've held out that's still unfulfilled. But for David, if he had an opportunity to ask of God just one thing, he says it would be to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life and to behold the fair beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. So let me put this in perspective for you. Church in ancient times was not like church as we had it this morning. It was temple worship. And in temple worship, where God's people gathered, the form of worship was the sacrifice of bulls and goats and sheep, unblemished sheep, turtle doves, and so on. The life was taken out of these animals. Worship in God's house was a gory, gory, bloody mess. And yet David is to say, if there's one thing I could, I could distill it all down to, and I have only one request, my request is that I would be able to be in God's temple. And I would seek the Lord there and behold his fair beauty. So what is David seeing when he's there? Well, he's looking past the blood. He's looking past the loss of life through animals. And he's seeing the deep love of God that provides a way for the sinfulness of man to be covered, atoned for. He sees God's love for humanity. And he says, when it all comes down to one thing, if I had to narrow it down to this, this one thing, this preeminent thing that I would ask for, is that I could be in God's presence and appreciate the depth of God's love of my life. That's powerful. Next slide. This only do I see that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Perhaps a similar passion burns with you. How many of you love just being in God's house? How many of you love being in God's house to the extent that if you had one request you could say, this one thing I ask of the Lord, that I could be around the Lord's table, the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, and I could observe and experience the death of God's love for the rest of my life. What burns inside you? Burns. King Solomon. He was a man with spiritual passion. In the early years of his life, he prayed for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom. And at the end of his life, he gives us a preeminent statement that sums up the full, the full extent of the wisdom that God has given him. He says, above all else, see that, the words above all else? When you say above all else, you're saying that this is the most important thing to me. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. You see, Solomon lived his life, though he asked for wisdom, he lived his life giving way to every temptation imaginable. He had countless wives. He had any materialistic thing he could ever want, and he satisfied or tried to satisfy himself with those things. But at the end of his life, what did he discover? Is that those things don't satisfy, they don't fill the void within. And the fullness of God's wisdom that he asked for, he was able to conclude that the most important thing is to guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. How careless many of us are with our own hearts, don't you think? We let images, language, different stimuli, we allow it into ourselves, not realizing that the King of Kings will not occupy the same space as this other stuff. What you let inside you will shape you to become whatever the nature of that thing is. It will prompt you 
to behave a certain way. And so Solomon says to us, the most important thing to me is that you put a sentinel around your heart. I put a sentinel around my heart to guard it so that only the king of kings and his virtues will dwell inside. And this became a burning passion for Solomon to the extent that he, he gives us one preeminent statement above all else. Guard your heart. Jesus, we're talking about a purpose-driven life here. Jesus lived such a life. Listen to this preeminent statement. <coughs> My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food. Everything that I take in, everything that gives me strength, is to do the will of him who sent me. And because that passion burned within Jesus, Jesus finished his work of redeeming mankind. He went to the cross, and on the cross, among his very last statements were, it is finished. Because he lived his life from the place of passion. It burned. Jesus commented on a man named John the Baptist. So as Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? See, a reed swayed by the wind is metaphorical for someone who doesn't stand for anything. It gives way to every external pressure. Has no direction, has no resistance, has no compass. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. John the Baptist was not a reed swayed in the wind. He was a man with fortitude. He was a man with direction. And he knew that he was called by God to prepare the way for the Messiah. That was his preeminent life calling. But let's look to Peter. Peter has a preeminent statement. At the end of his life, he has something that he says is above all, in terms of most importance. It sums up his spiritual passion. He says, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Peter was a man who was personally acquainted with failure. Right? Yes, Jesus bid him to come out in the water, and he walked on the water, but then he, for fear he began to sink. We know that Jesus is the disciple who betrayed Jesus or denied Jesus. How many times? Not once, not twice, but three times. He's a man acquainted with, with failure. But he also knew of God's forgiving love. God forgave him of those shortcomings. And growing out of that mercy that Peter experienced and that grace that became his own experience before God, there was something that burned within Peter during the days of him serving the Lord. And that is, no, what, no matter what anyone else has done, we need to love them to the extent that we forgive them. That was his experience. And above all else, he was saying, this is the most important thing. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. And then, well, let me just talk. So we have Jeremiah. What burns within him? A passion to share God's word. David, a passion to dwell in God's house, to experience the depth of God's love. Solomon, guarding the heart. Jesus, seeking and saving the lost. John the Baptist, preparing the way. And Peter, loving everyone unconditionally. What spiritual passion burns inside you? The Apostle Paul now here's a passionate man. Before he knew Christ, he was passionate. He was passionate in resisting the Jesus movement to the extent that he rallied the troops, arrested Christians, and even stood by as they were martyred. He was responsible for the murder of Christians. And then Jesus got a hold of him on the road to Damascus. And the ones that Peter or Paul persecuted became his new family. For Paul became a follower of Christ himself. What would his new passion be? Once it had been resisting the church, now he was a part of the church. What would his new passion be? And he says, 
Not that I have already obtained all this or already have arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to yet have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. You notice that statement? A preeminent statement. This one thing, the most important thing for me in my spiritual journey is this, to forget which is behind. What did he need to forget? See, it's one thing to know that God has forgiven us for the sins that we have done, but it's another thing to forgive ourselves. And he said he was the chief of all sinners, and he believed it. I need to forget that which is behind. I can't carry it forward with me. I need to let it go. And strain towards what is ahead. And press on to that goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so there it is, something that burns within the soul and the spirit of Paul. One thing I do, letting go of that which is behind so I can focus on what is ahead. There's a story told of a Filipino, uh, by a Filipino pastor of a caribou uh, wagon driver. And he's going to market one day and he overtakes an old man who's under this incredible burden and straining to take every step. And so the driver of the caribou wagon invites this old man to come aboard and he'll give him a ride. And the man graciously accepts and he's so thankful. And so he gets them to, to, on the wagon and they're traveling towards market and not too long after, the driver turns around to see how the old man is doing and he's surprised to find that the old man, though he's sitting in the wagon, has still got the heavy burden over his shoulders. And that's a picture of so many people in our churches today. Though we have been forgiven, we're still carrying the burdens of the past. And Paul says, we've got to let it go. This one thing I do is to forget that which is behind. You can't erase your memory, but you can remember it to the extent that it no longer hinders you. Letting go of the past and pressing on towards the mark. And so Paul imagines himself in an Olympic event. Back then it was called the Isthmus Games. That was the, the, the beginning of the Olympics. And he imagines himself in a race, running the race. And he says, I need to train myself. I need to prepare myself for this race. And I need to run towards the goal as if there's a prize. And he imagined himself being awarded with a, a laurel wreath on his head, crowned. He did that because that's what he needed to motivate himself to let go of the past and to push on towards the future, the high calling of Christ. This one thing I do. It's a preeminent statement that defines who he is. It's like Jack Sparrow's compass. It pointed him in the direction that he was destined to. And each one of us need to identify what our spiritual passion is and what burns within. What burns like a fire in our bones. What spiritual priority governs your life? and differentiates, differentiates you as a person who serves the Lord. What gnaws at you from the inside out? Is it worship? Do you just long to worship the Lord? If we were to ask Jackie, who's not with us this morning, she would say prayer. How many of you know that Jackie is a prayer warrior? Because it burns within her. You can't be in her presence without her wanting to pray for you. She prays all the time. I'm so grateful that she's a part of our church. But this is her spiritual passion. It burns within her. She cannot help but pray. Is your passion, is your, is, is your burning desire granted to witness? To be a light? I know it is. It burns within you. Every, every place you are, this is what you think. You want people to know that you're Christ and to influence them. Is it to serve the Lord? To serve the needs of people? Or is it to give? what you have away, or maybe it's it to write. There's something inside you that burns if you will just take notice. And if you're faithful to that, you're moving and living in God's will. Philip Yancey writes, the giants of the faith have one thing in common, neither victory or failure, passion. You see, inside you at the very core of your being is a kernel of passion and it needs to pop. It needs to be born into the fullness for which it was intended. 
this one thing I do, this one thing I ask, above all else, you have a spiritual passion. Woodrow Wilson said, you're not here to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more amply, with greater visions, with a finer spirit of hope and achievement. You are here to enrich the world, and you impoverish yourself if you forget the errand. A firebrand is a piece of wood that's burning. But metaphorically, it refers to someone who is passionate about a cause. A firebrand is someone who is passionate about a cause and incites change by taking radical action. And it's said of John the Baptist that until then, since the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing, and it is forceful people that take hold of it. One of the, the worst enemies of the church is that we feel we are impressing God by living good Christian lives. A good Christian life, it sounds very nice, but God has not called us to live good Christian lives. He's called us to live great lives. Good is the enemy of great. There is better. And someone who lives a great life is someone who lives out their passion. You can't hold it in. You simply cannot. Because there's a fire burning. What is it? You know. Heavenly Father. Powerful words for people that sometimes want to sit back and relax and enjoy the blessings. That's part of it. But you have called us to rise up and to let our light shine and to be the people you've called us to be. For every one of us, there would be a preeminent statement. Something that begins with, above all else, or this one thing I do, this one thing I ask. Help each of us to know what it is and to live our lives with reckless devotion as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, not as men-pleasers, but doing the will of God from our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.